Okay, let's start then. Let's keep it on time. So thanks everyone for, for coming. I will read some uh, introductory remarks and then we'll go to the presentations, okay? So first of all, I would like to thank everyone that is involved uh, in this exchange of views, as well as all the participants, citizens, and institutions that are seeing us online. Uh, I won't take much time because I do feel that the focus should be on the speakers and afterwards on the Q&A session. However, let me take a few minutes to share some political information and some technical details. Politically, this event has four main objectives. First, start the debate inside the European Parliament on unidentified anomalous phenomena, which is a topic that is dear to thousands of Europeans. The feedback that I've been having from several EU citizens and outside the EU borders has been overwhelming. Secondly, to decrease the, decrease the stigma associated with the topic inside important sectors of our society, such as civil aviation, the military, journalism, but also politics. Third, and probably the most important, it's essential that all the debates surrounding UAPs is based in the scientific method and held in close cooperation with public institutions, the academia, civil society, and all the professionals that are willing to open and voluntarily share their experiences. Fourth, and lastly, the path of the European Union in regards of UAPs must be made with transparency, data sharing, and accountability, so we don't lose our credibility in a topic that is dear to many of our constituencies and citizens. Whatever the findings, we must foster this scientific approach to improve our institutions. Therefore, my work as a member of the European Parliament focus on the creation of an EU harmonized system of monitoring, gathering and analysis of data on UAPs. The EU, institutionally composed of 27 member states, does not have such system and thus thousands of citizens and experienced professionals don't know or feel safe to report events they can't explain. We must improve our scientific methodology and connect the EU institutions to the public and academia, and academia in a transparent and credible way. For the sake of transparency, uh, as a politician, I've made three written questions to the European Commission, with just one by now was replied. I've also made two interventions in the European plenary about the subject, and last week I've introduced an individual motion for resolution that requests the European Commission uh, the creation of an harmonized system of collecting data and reporting on UAPs inside the EU by upgrading the regulations, uh, regulation 376 slash 2014 on the reporting analysis and follow up of occurrences in civil aviation. After these political considerations, let me present the panel and share some technical information. First, we'll have Mr. André Jol from UAP Quality Netherlands with a presentation about the topic of UAPs. Unfortunately, Mr. Joaquin Deckers could not be present due to health-related issues. After, we'll pass to Mr. Eduardo Russo from the UAP Czech and Euroinfonet, who will guide us on the UAP's history in the European Union. Thirdly, we'll listen to Mrs. Beatriz Villajuel from the Nordic Institute of Theoretical Physics of Stockholm University and member of the Sol Foundation to present us her vision on the scientific approach we should have on analyzing UAPs. After, we'll connect online to the US with a former Navy pilot and executive director of Americans for Safe Aerospace, Ryan Graves. He will enlighten us about the recent developments in USA on the topic. Finally, but not least, we'll hear an important share and testimony of a civil aviator pilot, Christian van Eist. So all the presentations will have up to 12 minutes, and in the end, we'll have some time for questions and answers. For the Q&A, you can make your questions in the chat online, uh, or raise your hand if you are present in the room. Please be concise when making your questions and direct them to a specific speaker if possible. For a final comment, let me just share that the presentations, views, and replies of each speaker are their solely responsibility, and those positions may not be shared by other speakers. So, after these clarifications, let's jump into the conversation. So, Mr. André, you have the floor, and you'll go directly to the slides. Thank you very much.
First of all, I'd like to say I'm very honored and privileged to be here, and I'd like to thank very much Francisco Guerrero for organizing this historic event. We from the UAP Coalition Netherlands are an independent NGO, and we represent the interests of professionals within aviation, armed forces, and police who did have an encounter with UAP anomalous, uh, unidentified anomalous phenomena. We also promote research, awareness raising, cooperation and regulations regarding UAP together with a dedicated team of volunteers. So it's essential to understand the significance of UAP, how they intersect with safety of our airspace, with our security and our collective consciousness. So let me first try to explain what are UAP. In a way, the most straightforward definition is this is anything which is in space, air, on land, or in the sea that cannot be identified. In the past, the term UFO, unidentified flying object, was used, but now with more information becoming available, more sensors being online, we know these phenomena are also observed in other domains like the sea, and therefore the acronym and definition was changed. Over the years, there has been an increase in evidence based on a wide range of instrumental observations, for example, infrared, radar, photographs, videos, but also visual observations. By trained observers, meaning pilots, military personnel, airfield personnel, scientists, etc., and also civilians. Near collisions involving military or commercial aircraft have actually been reported in the past. Many observations have also been done at military airfields with storage facilities for nuclear weapons and at nuclear power plants. We feel this is therefore really a serious topic. In recent years, many trained observers like pilots and people from the military have actually come forward uh, with their experiences and their observations. Now, what are we actually talking about? I've taken a slide from the organization JEPAN, which is the French official governmental organization which collects data on UAP, uh, analyzes these and reports on these. It's actually the only officially recognized uh, organization as such in Europe. But of course, there are also many civilian organizations doing similar things. Um, the main message here is actually that, first of all, most of the observation can be explained by, for example, aircraft, drones, satellites, planets, meteors, etc. However, as you will see in category D, there is a percentage of about 3%, and this is also the case in many other databases, which cannot be explained. And this is the interesting part of UAP. As said before, um, Eduardo Russo will talk much more about the history of UAP in Europe and outside of Europe. Now, the question, of course, is why should we care about UAP? Why are they important? And the other question is, are they really real? Well, you could argue if UAP are not real, that means that over the past 80 years, trained observers have been seeing things which are a fantasy. This does not appear to make sense, as we very much rely on these same professionals to be good observers in their professional capacities. Now, secondly, I think it's interesting to hear what key leaders and key people, for example, in the US are actually saying about the topic of UAP. So I want to show you a short presentation where various people are speaking out. I mean, I think the bottom line is that we don't understand everything that we're seeing, and that's probably not surprising to anybody in many respects. They locked their radar onto it, they followed it, and then all of a sudden it would move. And uh, it had no exhaust, it had no plume, uh, it had no visible wings or any kind of engines. So we don't know what it is, but it's something. That's why I'm announcing that NASA has appointed a NASA director of UAP research. We want that era to stop. If the computer can see something that they cannot identify, we need to know what that is. Uh, there's footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. We can't explain. Uh, how they move, their trajectory. Uh, they, they did not have um, an easily explainable pattern. This topic 
is is something that has been placed in the science fiction category. Um, however, the occurrence of UAPs near our military bases has been documented and poses a national security threat, especially since so much about them is, is virtually unknown. Okay, I think that was really interesting to listen to these statements. Uh, another development in the U.S. has been that in 2022, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office has been starting, which was explicitly established on the request of the U.S. Senate. It's a department inside the Pentagon that collects and analyzes UAP observations from U.S. governmental professionals and regularly reports on the results. Now, there's a lot to say about these reports. I will not do that here. Um, I believe that Speaker Ryan Graves will give some more insight in his own experiences as a pilot, but also talk about how the interest in the topic in the U.S. has been growing and what are the recent U.S. policy developments. The next question is, can we conclude that UAP poses a potential risk for flight safety? If a commercial pilot with passengers encountering a UAP, this could lead to confusion, distraction, and potentially even a risk of accidents. With 32,000 flights per day in the EU airspace, we feel it's necessary to address the topic. By understanding and addressing the UAP topic, we can enhance the safety and security of our skies. And Christian van Heist will give some of his uh, experiences and also experiences from other pilots. Another key aspect is the security concern. In this era of heightened political, geopolitical tensions and rapid technological developments, the presence of unidentified objects in our airspace raises questions about surveillance, defense capabilities and potential threats. We feel it's imperative that these issues are explored and addressed. It's also interesting to note that China has issued a shoot-down order of UAP in at least one and possibly several provinces. They're using AI to research UAP data and they consider UAP to be a national threat and a flight safety issue. We also know that the Russian government is aware of UAP and doing research on this topic. The next question is, what are the specific characteristics of this 3% of UAP, which is not explainable. What makes it unique? Experts use the term, the five observables. Positive lift. That means they have the ability to fly without apparent means of propulsion or lift. Instantaneous acceleration. They can reach very high rates of speed in a very short amount of time. Hypersonic velocity. They're able to travel faster, very much faster than the speed of sound with no uh, sonic boom or other physical effects. Transmedium travel. They seem to be able to seamlessly move through space, air, and water. And low observability. They're able to conceal themselves from visual and sensor observation. So this means that they represent a significant challenge to our current scientific knowledge and understanding. It's good to see that increasingly scientists are coming forward who consider UAP to be real objects that need serious investigation. By studying UAP, there is the opportunity to push the boundaries of our understanding of physics, technology, and perhaps even the nature of our universe. Beatrice Villaruel will, will of course, say more about the research uh, needs and also what is currently being done. The last thing I'd like to talk about is the importance of taking the UAP witnesses seriously. For more than 80 years, Professionals from aviation, armed forces, law enforcement, but also citizens who reported UAP sightings have faced skepticism, ridicule, or even professional repercussions. In this respect, I'd like to mention an example, which is quite famous in the Netherlands. It's the Susterberg case, which happened in 1979. Twelve Dutch military personnel saw, and actually independently, partly a triangular-shaped object around 45 meters in diameter slowly fly over their airbase, which by the way was a joint airbase with the US. And to this day, the witnesses feel that they were not taken seriously. This is from a documentary uh, recently released by Bram Rosa and uh, showing in many cinemas in the Netherlands. He ze hebben weggeroven van van de aardse en de luchtspiegelingen. Het waren dit en het was dat. Ja, en, en daar 
Hey, dat, dat kan niet. Als er zoveel mensen hier om je heen staan, dan is dat 100% serieus moeten nemen. So stigma and not being able to talk about encounters or even being ridiculed can certainly have a negative effect on health of professionals. The importance of sharing experience and emotions after such events is crucial for the well-being of these professionals. And therefore, and we feel this is also uh, true for UAP experiences. So therefore we feel psycho social support and creating an environment where professionals can freely share and process their experience and emotions is really important. And in that respect, uh, and it was already said by Francisco, we feel it's crucial that policymakers um, do create an environment and the required legislative frameworks to allow witnesses to feel comfortable coming forward with their experiences and knowing that they will be heard, respected and supported. We do hope that this historic event in the European Parliament will contribute to ending the stigma. Finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about what could be next. Firstly, we feel it's important to raise awareness and educate policymakers, professionals, scientists, the media and the public about the reality and the significance of UAP. Secondly, we need to prioritize data collection on UAP through advanced monitoring and we should enhance multidisciplinary research. By leveraging expertise, technological research, resources and international collaboration, we, gain, we can gain a deeper understanding of these phenomena. Thirdly, we need to establish clear protocols and procedures for reporting. This includes channels for pilots, military personnel, other trained observers to report sightings. And lastly, we should include UAP explicitly in relevant EU legislation, for example, on aviation safety and in the space law. Finally, my last slide. We feel all stakeholders within the EU have a responsibility to address this topic with seriousness, integrity and scientific rigor. By doing so, we can all ensure the safety, security and the well-being of our citizens. I thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward for the discussion on the topic. If you want to applaud, you can applaud. If you feel safe to applaud, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't be tense. You are free to do whatever you want, so don't worry. So now we'll, I will pass the word to Eduardo Husso. Well, the historical European context. UAPs are not just an American phenomenon, as some may think or believe. It's always been a global phenomenon with sightings and testimonies from all over the world. Europe has always been in a central position as of citing reports, even before the American public discovered the flying saucers in the summer of 1947. The first post-war wave of unidentified aerial sightings were the ghost rockets over Scandinavia, but also Italy, Greece, and the Mediterranean countries in 1946. And there are a lot of European witnesses. You may ask how many? We are talking of opinion polls that ask the question, not so many asking the question, who did you see a UFO? And we have some seemingly different percentages that amount to an average, a weighted average of 6.5% people having seen UFOs. If we remain to the European Union countries, that means as much as 29 million people having seen, thinking they have seen a UAP, a UFO, call it as you like. Not all witnesses are reporting their own sightings. Our estimates are that less than 1% of the witnesses are stepping forward and are reporting their sightings. Since the databases of case histories collected by the civilian UAP organizations are presently comprising about 170,000 reports. Is it much? Is it few? It's higher than the total number of USA reports as collected by our sister organizations in the United States of America. We are talking of Europe in a geographical sense, from Portugal to Ukraine, from Norway to Malta. Unidentified aerial phenomena are not regular in their apparitions. 
citing reports are coming in waves with rich or poor years. The first large wave of sightings was in the spring of 1950, and it was a really European one, hitting several countries, Belgium, Italy, Spain, the UK. An even greater UAP panic took place in the autumn of 1954, with thousands of cases, mostly in France, and so on and so on. We had the national waves in the UK in 1967, in Spain, 68, in Italy, 73, in France, 74. Important waves of UAP sightings took place in most European countries along the last 75 years at last. My own country, Italy, suffered such a stronger UAP wave in the late 1978 that fishermen refused to go out fishing. Police patrols were sent photographing str strange lights in the sky. Parliamentary questions were asked and the government charged the Italian Air Force to begin a formal collection of testimonies from the public. You can see here one of the national examples with the peaks and the sightings in, in certain years and not in others. Even if 90, 95, even 98 percent of those UAP phenomena are later identified and explained with known natural phenomena or man-made objects, which is precisely the grassroots activity of us UAP investigators, we are left with a small yet not negligible the residue of anomalous cases totaling thousands of UAPs in the strict sense unidentified in a European scale. What are people seeing? The largest part of sightings are either distant lights in the sky, you see more than 75% of reports, or of distant daylight flying objects. But we also have got higher strangeness and higher credibility reports as close encounters when the phenomenon is not more far than 150 meters from the observer. And it is about uh, the 10% of, this is just a national sample, my national sample from Italy. It's about 28,000 reports. The special cases I'm referring to Maybe sightings from the military, maybe physical effects, temporary physical effects on the surrounding environment. Pilot reports that we have been talking about that Andre mentioned before. Ground traces. Radar detection cases. And just think that we cannot get all radar detection cases since a large part of it of them are military case histories, and we are not given unless there is some declassification of data. And more recently, the attention moved to the sea, to the water, and you see we have about 1%, less, less more than 1% of USOs, underwater objects, we, you can choose a name for them. And there are social side effects, uh, which have been the, the object of academic studies by psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists. Even if I can't talk here now some real panic situations, we are left with a great number of people wondering what they saw, millions of people, who have a right to an answer if there is one, but cannot find anybody officially charged to give one to them and are crushed between those telling them you were drunk and those believing it's just extraterrestrial visitors. It's only the private organizations, the volunteers that take charge of these people, of their testimonies, trying to find and offer those answers to witnesses. They are, we are unpaid volunteers that are doing this by passion. There are a few hundreds of serious-minded private researchers who try to apply a scientific approach within the European Union. And there are dozens of rational associations of them, one in nearly every European country, some of them having been active for decades. 
Just think that the British National Association has been founded in 1964. The Catalonian Spanish organization since 1958. And the Danish one, 1957. What are they doing? They are collecting testimonies. They are doing field investigation, trying to find a solution. They can find an explanation for the large, largest, very largest part of the testimonies. They are, we are collecting documentation, archiving, and offering support for study and research that is not our business. It's not the private volunteers that have to do to make scientific study. It's to the scientists. And we are doing an activity of public education, conferences, congresses, interviews. Just think that the largest existing archive about UFOs in the world is in Sweden, the archives for the unexplained. The military. The military have traditionally been collecting UFO, UAP reports within their proper mission of controlling and defending each nation airspace. Most, if not all, European countries have had its own military archives of mostly military reports, just like in the USA. We all know about Project Blue Book, but something similar has been existing all over the world, nearly all over the world, and in nearly all European countries. But what I want to tell and to stress is that as many as 10 European countries have declassified their military UAP archives or opened their UAP files in part or in total, which is amounting now to several thousands of reports available for a study. And what about the other countries? Well, we have another 10, 12 countries that have done the same. But let's remain to Europe now. As for non-military, yet government organizations, I'm not talking about private volunteers, collecting and analyzing UAP reports, can I say that the only one, not just in Europe, but in the world, is in France. In 1970, 1977, the National Space Study Center, CNES, the European NASA, if you want, created a study group on unidentified airspace phenomena. They called them phenomena, they called airspace, not just aerial. The Japan now changed the name twice, it's Japan. It's not only still active, as Andre showed, but still offering investigations and precisely that service to the French public only, collecting their testimonies trying to identify the causes, offering those answers to the public. We will get back to them. What about the politicians? Well, they have been involved since the beginning. Parliamentary questions were asked in most European countries since at least 1950. And the European Parliament got its own share of them too. You may see that there is a collection bias here because I got too many Italian ones, but uh, we are sure that France had quite a collection that has not been collected uh, properly. Uh, and around Europe, can I say that Europe is, in was, is including the United Kingdom? Look at how many. You know the British Parliament is a special kind of Parliament. 110 parliamentary questions since 1950. Not bad. And the Euro Parliament, nine. Even if we take away the two ones by Francisco Guerrero that uh, elevated the total, it's seven times more. But not just questions. We have a precedent when in the last part, in the last few months of 1989, Belgium, the country we are now sitting suffered a heavy wave of sightings, several thousands in, of, let's say, one month, one month and a half, taking the local 
UAP study group, the SOBEPS, the Société Belge d'études de phénomènes spatiaux, to have a collection in two volumes of two volumes of several hundred pages. Well, it was a European. No, not yet. He was a. Uh, it was a a, a Belgian uh, Euro mem member of the European Parliament. I should say for chauvinism of Italian origin, Elio Di Rupo, later becoming uh, uh, the first minister of Belgium years later, that asked a question and uh, obtained that uh, the Committee of Energy, Research and Technology of the European Parliament began an investigation. Uh, the committee charged an Italian scientist that was a member of the parliament at the time to do that work. And he offered a proposal of resolution, not creating a new office, but giving the French Japan, we told about, a European status. Then the action went another way, the legislature finished and uh, it remained uh, like that. So the ball is once again here. What are we doing about it? What are you doing about it? We don't know. This is a very short and quick uh, panorama about European history of UAP and UAP studies. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Just signals the importance of us having a uniform system and an harmonized system here in the European Union to collect this data and to then be dealt by professionals uh, on the matter. So I'll then speak, uh, pass the word to Mrs. Beatriz Villajuel. I don't know if I pronounced it correctly. I hope so. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So I will tell you about uh, science and the UAPs. So, in 1952, on 19th of July, uh, on an airport, a Washington National Airport, uh, the air traffic controllers, when they were looking at the radars, they saw multiple weird objects that shouldn't be there. And this was seen on several radars. And later, also witnesses like stewardesses, pilots, saw things in the air at the same time. And uh, during these weeks, especially during these two consecutive weekends, there were multiple objects seen, multiple radars that were moving with, had, had weird movements, really big, big speeds. And many witnesses saw this. There were something like 500 sightings uh, in U US of UFOs reported that month, like 35 times more than on average. And what happened in this time period, uh, where they even had like fighter jets hunting for these mysterious objects that nobody knew what it was. Uh, what happened then was that even President Truman had to acknowledge that something was seen. So the U.S. Air Force on the 29th of July 1952, they held the largest press conference in the United States after the end of the Second World War to discuss this kind of uh, Washington flap at the same time this is, is referred to. And what they did was saying, well, the radar observations were some kind of weather disturbances and whatever the people saw in the sky at that time, that must have been some kind of misidentification. And uh, that's where we're, where we're going to start this conversation. Welcome to my talk. I'm an astronomer. I'm also a uh, L'Oreal UNESCO um, International Rising Thailand's uh, prize winner in 2022. And my research topic of one of my research topics uh, is searches for extraterrestrial intelligence. And that is what brings me here. So we have already heard the very good uh, cases for that people see things that shouldn't be there in the air. And we, there are multiple really good historical cases where you have uh, where things have been measured with multiple instruments, like was lifted by the RO uh, or Pentagon report in 2021. And uh, now the question is, of course, what does science say about this? The picture is not as bright in science because there's a huge stigma that has been preventing scientists from researching the topic over the last 70 years. It's a really, really serious stigma. It's difficult to publish. And because it's difficult to publish, 
then you can, if you get some evidence and you cannot get it published, then again, it's said that there is no evidence, so therefore you can publish it. You get the catch-22. So right now, the scientific evidence is missing for the phenomenon. It is not established as a phenomenon according to physical scientists. And uh, uh, what I wanted to say was um, this can all change, of course, because we need measurements, we need data. There is a, a big mismatch between what has been reported and collected and what has been documented and what the uh, governments know. It, it, ma many things have been classified, while uh, in, um, in civil science, we simply haven't been having the chance to really look into this phenomenon. However, something that uh, is not as stigmatized is searches for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is actually, there are many astronomers working within this topic. So far, nothing has been found. But uh, within, if you just look at the ET hypothesis for the UAP, we know that there are billions of uh, planets that look like the Earth and that are in the habitable zone. And we also know that we humans are capable of uh, creating a probe like Voyager and Pioneer and send it to another star already now. It just will take a very long time. And we also know that biomolecules have been found on uh, meteorites. So there's a very good case for that there's lots of life out there and many, may, maybe even many advanced civilizations. So NASA last year, they, they made a report. They had a panel of 16 people and they had a look at the UAP evidence and they found actually a number of mysterious metallic orbs in images and they started uh, a UAP directorship. So there is now a UAP director uh, at NASA, which means this is a topic we should really take seriously. And there are different methods for stu studying UAPs. The first thing, of course, is that uh, one effort I really admire is by the Sigma 2, led by Luc Denis, where they are looking at cases where they have multiple measurements and have witnesses. And then they go actually do very beautiful modelings and simulations, trying to test different hypotheses, because hypothesis-driven science is very important, not only looking for the thing that remains, but uh, testing different hypotheses. And, they do really excellent work and with testing famous cases and or well-documented cases. Uh, another very, very famous effort now is the one of the Galileo project, where they are, are building a system to detect everything that moves on the sky with, the, say, with radars, observations with optical telescopes, with infrared uh, cameras. And here you see a picture of an infrared camera ray. And then they will use machine learning to, class, to say what the different object is so that you can separate a fighter jet from a three-winged duck or anything else that moves through the sky or an UAP. So this is a really beautiful effort led by Avi Loeb and Harvard. So a third way, which I, I'm more inclined into, is actually testing the actual hypothesis of that we are dealing with non-human objects um, from an advanced civilization far away, let's say they send a probe to our solar system. And probes, uh, anything artificial is going to reflect sunlight as if it's very flat. I mean, I mean, it's always reflects sunlight, but um, if it's very flat, you can get short uh, flashes. And these short flashes, you can uh, actually see from the Earth, even if the object is small. And we see them there, like, we can see satellites every day, and in the same way, we can see these alien objects. And uh, the way to do that, uh, to actually separate human objects from alien or ET objects, is by, for example, using images from before Sputnik 1, the first human satellites. So what could you expect to see? Well, you could expect to see multiple such flashes. You could see, see either single, or you can see several along a line, or you can just and see multiple. And have, has anyone ever seen something? Well, in 2021, we found a very weird example where you could see nine stars or flashes appearing and vanishing within a short time period. And um, so um, here, we didn't know if it was real or not. We tried to, we could exclude every conventional astronomical explanation. Uh, we tried a lot of instrumental explanations. We were wondering, could this be some kind of plate defect, some kind of nuclear fallout that got stuck on it? 
And this became a mystery for us because if real, if a real observation, then it was best fit by, um, well, what we discussed before, maybe UAPs or maybe some new physics, we don't know. Here's another example where you see much clearer, much clearer such flashes. There are three bright stars that appear and vanish within 50 minutes in an image from the 19th of July, 1952. And this was published in the monthly notices of Royal Astronomical Society, which is uh, one of the most respected astronomical journals. Uh, and it was posed as a mystery. When it comes to things that are aligned, here you see another example of several along a line from the 27th of July, 1952. Uh, and the probability to get such kind of flashes or just any objects uh, in a line is one in 10,000. You can estimate it. This has not been published because it's faced a huge stigma during the review, review process. However, those who took note of my introduction might also recognize that there's something funny about the dates I presented, and that's that they happened right during the Washington flap, which we don't know if this is a coincidence or not. And these are our both most beautiful examples, and they were found before I ever heard about the Washington flap. So how can we actually test this? Well, we have designed a separate experiment where we have, uh, we're going to have a network of telescopes, of wide field telescopes with high speed cameras that are looking specifically for these kind of fast flashes. And the goal is to detect something, to verify it in multiple telescopes, but once you have multiple telescopes, you can also localize it. And if you localize it very well, you might be able to bring down the object to the Earth. And uh, as I said, we will try to localize the object through the use of multiple telescopes. And by setting, by controlling the distance between each telescope, you can actually also focus your searches far outside our atmosphere, because I'm not interested to deal with any human objects. I want to be far away from any, any satellites or anything of national security interest. And the Exopro project is going to be uh, specifically designed to avoid anything human. We also have a special method to remove all these millions of pieces of uh, space debris that is currently contaminating our skies. So we have developed a met method for that. And we, we then can get rid of all satellites and all space debris, and we can really focus on flashes from uh, extraterrestrial objects. And once you have an object, you can also characterize it through spectrum. You can see what is it actually? Uh, is this flash some kind of uh, reflection, or is it something in some intrinsic emission? And now you know the place. You you have characterized the objects. You know uh, when it appears. You can actually send a team there to pick down the object because we humans are capable of bringing down objects to the earth. Like was um, the Osiris Rex, for example, uh, brought down a sample of a meteor uh, of a asteroid in uh, September 2023. It's a very beautiful project. So we have all the technology to do that as well if we need to. Uh, here was a very nice simulation that unfortunately cannot be shown in PDF. So I will just leave you with the topic of what can European Union do for us scientists to be able to carry out our research work, to search for UAPs and to get the infrastructure we need to carry out our research. And I want to thank you for it very much. And uh, so <laughs> if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them now or later. So all the questions will be uh, made after the, the, all the presentations. So we then have the specific time for, for that. Just to, to let you know that uh, you might know this, and it is, is obvious, but Galileo is an EU project uh, that is funded by Humani. So the relevance, uh, it's, it's really, really high. And we have a difference between our approach to space than, for example, the US. So here is more civil base, more connected to civil society and scientists, the US. It's a bit different, uh, as we know. Um, there's also being uh, written the European Space Law by the European Commission. They all also uh, made uh, a public um, appeal to uh, commentaries, and some uh, some commentaries from institutions uh, were also presented. So let's see how this law uh, is drafted, this directive. Uh, there's a pillar of safety uh, also in this law that I think should be also exploited in the next mandate, exploited in a sense that should be 
concerning also this topic uh, and obviously this this harmonization that is coordination of of instruments that we have should be uh, available to the to the scientific uh, community so we now have christian van eist a uh, civil aviation pilot sorry if i mispronounce your name <laughs> it's fine, okay <laughs> You guys hear me fine? I think the microphone is working. Well, thanks for uh, allowing me to be here. My name is Christian van Heist. I'm a Dutch airline pilot with over 20 years of professional flying experience, close to 10,000 flying hours. And besides that, I'm a professional photographer as well. I started my flying career flying turboprops in Africa, military operations in Afghanistan. After a couple of years, I moved to Boeing 737 that I flew all across Europe for about five years. And for the last... Um, 13, almost 14 years I've been flying the Boeing 747 all across, all across the world and in the capacity of captain, commander since the last uh, three years. Uh, I must really say I didn't, never really had a real interest in the UAP or UFO topic. I seen some things in the beginning part of my career that I found peculiar, but I always thought together with my colleagues that it must have been something military. Um, it was only after I saw the testimony from Mr. Ryan Graves and also Commander David Fravor um, that I started to realize that the things that I've been seeing in the first couple of years of my flying career were actually um, maybe more special than I initially thought. I must say also in the last 20 years of flying, I've seen a lot of things from the cockpit. I've seen uh, military operations, meaning I've seen a lot of rockets, missiles, uh, I've seen a lot of explosions, I've seen um, satellites, I've seen rockets being blown up in the sky, all sorts of uh, celestial fireworks, let's say. Uh, but some of the things still defy an explanation. And it's only, as I said, after I saw the uh, testimonies from Ryan Graves that I started to dig in further into my own experiences. And basically, I wanted to know what I've seen. I basically wanted to uh, debunk the whole topic within two weeks because I had some vacation time and I just dove into it. And I basically came to the conclusion that the stuff that I've been seeing um, was just basically not explicable right now. And I started to worry more and more about the flight safety aspect of all those sightings because I'm flying uh, sometimes at 200 hours a month uh, all across the world. And if there are things flying next to my airplane or pretty close to my airplane or close to the flying path of my airplane that are not identifiable, not even by air traffic control, this could pose a serious issue. So I decided to come forward. I'm one of the first, not really the first, but one of the first commercial pilots to come forward with my sightings in a, an effort to break the stigma and to hope that the flight safety aspect can be discussed openly, even if it means that uh, we find out that it's a new weather phenomena or a new type of bird. I honestly don't really care. I just want to get to the bottom of it and make sure that professionals like me have a way to report these sightings. Now about my own sightings, uh, as I said, in the last uh, 20 years of flying, I've seen a lot of interesting things. Uh, the most uh, anomalous were actually only taking place in the first few years of my flying career, and they always took place over Europe, which is important to note, because many people think that the UAP or UFO topic is something from Hollywood, it's American, but I can assure you it's definitely not. My first sighting uh, was over Germany at night. Um, it was a bright light that basically fell vertically down with an incredible speed. It disappeared into the clouds below. It illuminated the clouds below our airplane, um, indicating that it was something really outside of the cockpit. It wasn't just a reflection that I've seen. And even my instructor, which was flying next to me, it was one of my first flights as a commercial pilot, was really uh, shocked by what we saw, and I never found an explanation for what it was. Almost uh, four years later, I saw something very similar over the coast of uh, Greece. Uh, it was a clear, clear Bright day, no clouds, no no thunderstorms around. We were flying at around 36,000 feet and suddenly there was just roughly 10 kilometers ahead of us and a little bit to the east of us, a bright light falling vertically down. Uh, the moment we saw it, it's, I think it's, uh, it must have been uh, coming in at an altitude of around 60,000 feet, which was the moment we could actually see it uh, coming into the uh, the window frame. And it fell down within, let's say, roughly one and a half seconds into the sea, just disappearing into the Adriatic Sea. Uh, we quickly made a short calculation on the back of our hands, and we calculated that it was moving, not even falling, but vertically moving with a speed of around 30,000 kilometers an hour, which is uh, hypersonic, which is just incredible. 
I immediately asked air traffic control if there was any military activity, if there was any rocket launches or maybe something else going on. Uh, the military air traffic controller dismissed it immediately and he left us just without uh, any question, without any answers to our question. Another sighting which happened uh, over Greece, it happened in the same night that the carrier group with the USS Theodore Roosevelt, the American nuclear powered aircraft carrier, was uh, passing by just south of our location. And all of a sudden, it was a bright night, uh, it was just a full sky full of stars, no clouds. We saw a very bright light appearing in the, in the sky just ahead of us. It was impossible to judge how high it was, but it was, let's say, among the stars. It was very high. It disappeared and reappeared four times in succession. It, it was moving not like any satellite or airplane I've seen. And the fourth time it reappeared, it shot out with instantaneous speed and it just dis disappeared along among the stars. I have no other way to explain it, but the speed was just instantaneous and absolutely incredible. And we've never seen anything like this before. Neither my colleague who was sitting next to me saw it as well. Um, as, as I said, uh, that same night, the USS Theodore Roosevelt was passing by. So our default answer was, well, it must be something military, probably connected. Um, but still, it was always in the back of my mind because I, I could, I, I simply cannot even imagine what type of technology or propulsion could, could generate such an instantaneous speed. And the fourth, uh, sighting that I had, uh, took a little bit longer than a few seconds. It actually took, uh, almost a full hour. I don't know if we can switch to the next picture. Uh, it was an over flight over uh, Spain from Amsterdam to Malaga with a Boeing 737. We just passed into Spain over the Pyrenees. It was uh, sunset. The sun had already set below the horizon. And all of a sudden, my colleague is asking me if I could identify the strange type of flying airplane that was a flying object that was ahead of us. As you can see in the picture here, um, it had a really strange shape. And the reason why we were really curious on what, what we were seeing is that we were flying already at an altitude of 41,000 feet, which is significantly higher than most commercial uh, traffic. We were flying this high because we're pretty much empty. And we also got a direct course to the airport of Malaga because the airspace was pretty much empty. We were the only ones flying there. So we didn't have to follow any airways, highways in the air. And for about 15 minutes, this object, whatever it was, it was hanging ahead of us significantly higher. And it didn't show any signs of a contrail, no tail, no engines, which you normally see when we spot other airplanes in the sky. Um, and after about 15 minutes, it didn't move relative to our position. It didn't change altitude. It didn't grow bigger or larger or smaller, indicating that it would move to or from us. So after about, uh, as I said, 15 minutes, I contacted air traffic control, the civilian air traffic controller, asking what type of airplane it was, because we were just wondering what kind of machine this would be. Uh, the air traffic controller was really surprised. He said, no, as far as, far as I know, uh, you guys are the only one over the entire uh, Iberian Peninsula. So he asked us to describe what we, what we saw, um, and he was absolutely clueless. And in, after a couple of minutes, he came back to me. He said, well, military air traffic control wants to know what you guys are seeing, because they're very interested as well. This was, by the way, in 2010. I'm not sure if the date is important, but anyway, it was, was already a while ago. So uh, military air traffic controller uh, was interested. I told him all the details, and he basically uh, uh, confessed to us that there was no known traffic all the way up to uh, Morocco, for as far as he knew. No military uh, activities, no weather balloons, absolutely nothing going on. So we were just left clueless with what we've seen. Um, we saw the object all the way up to... The, uh, our descent into Malaga, which was almost 55 or 60 minutes later. And for a full hour, we just saw this object straight ahead of us. It didn't really pose a threat for as far as I know, at least it was pretty far away. But for the longest time, uh, it's now already uh, 14 years ago, um, I've just been wondering what I've been seeing. And I'm really... Uh, disappointed that I was never able to report this sighting anywhere. Later on, I found out there are uh, websites like uh, organizations like a UAP Check or MUFON. For me as a professional, I was not really interested in the topic and I was not even aware of those organizations. So I was just left absolutely clueless with my sightings. Since I came forward about uh, two years ago publicly with podcasts and interviews, uh, a lot of my colleagues have come forward uh, privately, both in flight and also after the flight during dinner with their own experiences, which are sometimes um, uh, much more significant than my own experiences. 
Some of my colleagues have reported uh, glowing or silver objects hovering next to the flight deck, next to the cockpit of their airplane, sometimes flying close to the speed of sound. Some of them have reported groups of pulsating lights overtaking them while flying at uh, significant altitude and speeds. And also other colleagues have seen uh, different sorts of lights, pul pulsating lights, etc. It's uh, it's very varied. It doesn't really fit any uh, certain type of description. Uh, the only common denominator is that we as pilots, we can never report it anywhere. So I think it's very important that there should be a way to get rid of the stigma. So pilots and professionals and military personnel are allowed to talk openly about it without repercussions. And there should be a way for us to report it um, in, in a way that these sightings and maybe even pictures, because a lot of my colleagues even took pictures of the stuff they've seen, uh, should be analyzed in an objective and neutral way, because that's the only way to find out what else is flying in our airspace. So uh, long story short, these are my modest experiences, one of them with an the actual picture. And I just want to get to uh, to the bottom of it. I want to know what else is flying next to my airplanes. Thank you. Let me underline the courage that it takes for several professionals to talk about their experience, but also our responsibility of not uh, taking them seriously and do create a system of transparency that professionals of this, this specific area, but others can uh, feel free and safe to report their findings and then having the scientific methodology to analyze this data and understand what's, what it is, uh, besides the noise that we all know surrounds this topic. So I think we should focus always on the experience, on the technical parts, on the scientific approach that we should have to this uh, debate, but also the political um, initiative that should also lead here in the European Union, because we are talking about uh, thousands of flights that occur every year in the European Union. And, well, this, this phenomenon is, is not just uh, related to civil aviation, but also space. And we also know that some of these occurrences also uh, happen at sea. So let's see if our current... Uh, let's try. Yeah, let's try the Ryan from US. Thank you for convening this public hearing on this topic. It's been stigmatized for far too long. Unidentified anomalous phenomenon or UAP are real, observed and documented by credible sources, yet we know very little about them. Thanks to efforts like today, we are starting to see that change. My name is Ryan Graves and I'm a former F-18 pilot with a decade of service in the United States Navy. I have witnessed advanced UAP firsthand, and I founded Americans for Safe Aerospace to support other air crew and military witnesses and investigate this mystery. Today, I would like to call attention to three critical issues that demand our immediate attention. One, pilots are seeing UAP every day. We need to trust their expertise and support them coming forward. I know from my own personal experience and from pilots and military air crew who share their experiences with me that UAP are worthy of investigation. But too often, pilots are afraid to share their stories due to stigma. To understand UAP, we must start by collecting the data. As we convene here, UAP are in global airspace, but they are grossly Sorry, Ryan, underreported. Sorry, we just lost the, the voice. We had your image, we had your voice, we had both. But then... Check, check. Sorry for the technical problems. Should we just move forward with the voice? Yeah, we just go with the voice. Sorry. Continue. No problem. Uh, all right, very good. To understand UAP, we must start by collecting the data. <clears throat> As we convene here, UAP are in global airspace, but they are grossly underreported. These sightings are not rare or isolated, they are routine. Military air crews and commercial pilots, trained observers whose lives depend on accurate identification, are frequently witnessing these phenomena, but are either unable or unsure how to report UAP officially. Three. Government plays an important role to destigmatize UAP and to investigate the phenomenon. The stigma attached to UAP is real and powerful. It silences commercial pilots who fear professional repercussions and discourages military witnesses from sharing their reports. Governments can help by taking reports seriously and creating mechanisms to collect UAP data and investigate and evaluate it through to solve this mystery. Four. UAP are a global phenomenon, and international civilian collaboration is important. There's enormous potential to work collaboratively to better understand UAP. 
Whether it is through advocacy, international dialogue, or scientific collaboration, the scope of UAP will not be fully understood without global civilian partnerships. I'll take a moment to share my story. In 2014, I was an F-18 pilot in the Navy Fighter Attack Squadron 11, the Red Rippers, and stationed at NAS Oceana in Virginia Beach, Virginia. After upgrades were made to our jet's radar system, we began detecting unknown objects operating in our airspace. At first, we assumed they were radar errors, but soon we began to correlate the radar tracks with multiple onboard sensors, including infrared systems and eventually through visual ID. During a training mission in Warning Area Whiskey 72, 10 miles off the coast of Virginia Beach, two F-18 Super Hornets were split by a UAP. The object, described as a dark gray or a black cube inside of a clear sphere, came within 50 feet of the lead aircraft and was estimated to be 5 to 15 feet in diameter. The mission commander terminated the flight immediately and returned to base. Our squadron submitted a safety report, but there was no official acknowledgement of the incident and no further mechanism to report the sightings. Soon, these encounters became so frequent that air crew would discuss the risk of UAP as part of their regular pre-flight briefs. The UAP we encountered and tracked on multiple sensors behaved in ways that surpassed our understanding, appearing motionless against hurricane force winds, accelerating to over Mach 1, and outlasting our fighter jets. This experience, shared by many other aircrew along the eastern coast, continues nearly a decade later, and the identity, identity of these UAP remain unknown. Recognizing the need for action and answers, I founded Americans for Safe Aerospace. We believe that UAP present an urgent priority for both aerospace safety and scientific inquiry. Our focus is on improving public education of UAP, breaking stigma, and working towards better transparency and disclosure. I'm proud and honored that more than 12,000 people have joined us in our mission at safeaerospace.org. Anyone can join, and I'm confident this is just the beginning. Last year, I testified before the U.S. Congress. The organization has also become a haven for military and commercial air crew who have witnessed UAP. One of the biggest challenges these witnesses faced is reporting and the absence of safe intake processes. We are actively working with commercial and military witnesses who have come forward to us and shared their accounts. We work with each witness on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the witness's goals, but typically they contact us for help navigating official channels in the U.S. government. In cases with policy implications or where further investigation may be possible, we have helped witnesses share their experiences with members of Congress, professional staff of the Senate Armed Service Committee, investigators at the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, which is tasked with investigating UAP, and other agencies. The majority of witnesses who have contacted us are commercial pilots at major airlines. Often they are veterans with decades of flying experience. Pilots are reporting UAP at altitudes that appear to be above them at 40,000 feet, potentially in low earth orbit in the gray zone below the Kármán line, making inexplicable maneuvers like right-hand turns in retrograde orbits or J-hooks. Sometimes these reports are reoccurring with numerous recent sightings north of Hawaii in the northern Atlantic. Some of these reports may represent Starlink satellite flaring, but many defy easy explanations. We are working to improve resources to assist pilots with these identifications. In January, I'm proud to share that the Safe Aerospace for Americans Act was introduced in order to give commercial pilots an official, confident, and direct channel to report UAP encounters. If pilots see something, they should be able to say something and learn from it. Other witnesses I work with are military veterans who are sharing UAP encounters with their airspace and oceans. The most compelling involve observations by UAP by multiple witnesses and sensor systems. In these cases, again, most witnesses want their accounts documented and evaluated by the U.S. government, but there is much more work to be done by the U.S. military to support UAP reporting. I believe military and commercial aircrew witnesses who reach out to Americans for Safe Aerospace are just beginning. We're really only scratching the surface and more witnesses will share their experiences once it is safe to do so. We believe that safe reporting is crucial to uncover the truth and better understand UAP. And we are committed to supporting pilots and advocating for their voices to be heard by elected leaders and government officials. Briefly, I wanna share a few of the problems and challenges that we face addressing UAP in the United States. First, at the most fundamental level, the need for improved reporting and data collection cannot be overstated. I believe more than 90% of UAP events go unreported in the United States. Secondly, UAP transparency remains a challenge. 
UAP represent a national security problem as much as a scientific opportunity. As a result, there is a delicate balance of UAP information that can be made available to the public responsibly. The U.S. military has a vested interest to keep military secrets secret. Even under landmark UAP transparency legislation, the Disclosure Act of 2023, that was passed in the law with several key provisions removed, such as the Civilian Review Board, the President, as Commander-in-Chief, has a right to delay disclosure of UAP records indefinitely for national security reasons. Therefore, there is a unique role and public benefit for nonprofit organizations, academics, scientists to study UAP and make those findings publicly available. I'm happy to report incredible progress has been made on this front. In addition to Americans for Safe Aerospace, the newly founded Seoul Foundation at Stanford, the Galileo Project at Harvard, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics are all examples of private sector efforts that have potential to change our understanding of UAP. The U.S. military is taking this issue seriously because it continues to detect hard to explain events in defended airspace. As recently as this December, Langley Air Force Base in Virginia, which hosts the F-22 Raptor and helps defend Washington, D.C., was subject to waves of mysterious UAS overflight with a range of sizes and configurations. General Gregory M. Gillette, the new NORAD commander since February, testified to the Senate Armed Service Committee on March 14, 2024, and I quote, I've gone into the events at Joint Base Langley Eustis, and I'm using that as the centerpiece of my 90-day evaluate assessment to see where NORAD and NORTHCOM can and should do more as this emerging capability outstrips the operational framework that we have to address it." End quote. In addition, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office in the Pentagon announced earlier this month that it is also deploying purpose-built hyperspectral sensors to military bases and training ranges to detect, track, and characterize UAP. Simply put, the American military knows there is a domain awareness gap around small form factor objects and is working to close it. How much will be disclosed about the most anomalous cases remains to be seen. In closing, UAP truly are a global phenomenon. I recognize the skepticism surrounding this subject, but UAP will only be understood if we dedicate ourselves to pursuing and evaluating data. Thank you for your time today. Ryan, can you just test your camera, please? Okay, Hello. we see you now Hello. in the end. <laughs> we see you. Okay. So at least we have you for the Q&A. We can see you. We did listen to all of your presentations. Thank you very much. Um, and I think what you said was really important. So this delicate balance, obviously, about some issues that might be national security, but others that are just uh, being handled by civil society and um, institutions that are not bound by uh, any political or, or institutional uh, framework. So I think we should connect them. And as a politician, I think that should be a, a task for the next mandate because we are ending here in the European Parliament this mandate. Uh, but I think this should be treated as a serious topic as with a scientific base. And so uh, thank you for your uh, courage also to, to, to step up and bring more uh, individuals' insights the military sector to talk about their experience, but also to uh, gather these um, uh, yeah. instruments so uh, these uh, professionals can clearly uh, present their experiences. And also uh, you and several others pushed legislation in the U.S. that helped uh, also these professionals to talk about their experience. So. Uh, now that we listen to this very interesting and important uh, presentations, let's go to the Q&A. I would start by uh, the public there is here present, then we'll go to, to, to online if there's any questions, but feel free to, to question if you don't feel it is to, to state your name or rank or something, just make a question, feel free. Uh, if not, I'll do. But feel free. Take your time, please. Yes. Hello. I'm Jean-Marc Watkin from COBEPS, Comité Belge d'Études des Phénomènes Spatiaux. I'm in the head of the Investigator Network. I have a question for Mrs. Beatrice Fila Rouals. Yeah. Uh, it's fine to, to look in the deep sky. 
after the lights. But is it possible to look to, to the, to the, to the earth with the satellites? Because we have uh, a lot of, um, gases of UAPs and we can match satellite photographic and a case. Is it possible to get information from this kind of sources? Is it possible to go back in the past? Well, I, I guess we can always go uh, back in the past. I mean, not, I, I think in, not in 1952 directly uh, for my examples, but if we just generally, uh, it depends on the resolution of the satellite imagery and exactly what you want to do, because uh, I think a lot of, of the publicly available satellite imagery is not going to have the resolution that you need in order to look for such, such small objects as our UAPs. And uh, so, of course, um, the, the less publicly available satellites probably do that. And I'm sure that militaries have an ability of seeing a lot of different things. But as, I think for civilian scientists, it might not be the most fruitful approach, I would say. I would prefer to look up. Yes, so just for those who are here in the room, if you want to make a question, do it. You just press here the button, you speak to the to the micro, and then you shut the, the micro up. Um, and yeah, please. Uh, hello, I'm Frederic Delar from the Belgium UFO um, uh, hotline, and uh, we receive every year about uh, 200 observations. Uh, we are very critical, uh, skeptic, you may say, uh, because since the start of our um, hotline, we received 3,700 uh, observations and only 54 we cannot um, explain. So uh, my question was, is there going to be place uh, in this European initiative for civilian organizations like us? Because I think a lot of information that we have that the scientists don't like, get uh, access to. So um, that was the question. So I guess that was directed to me. Uh, yes, uh, well, uh, there's, there's a political decision. So uh, I introduced this individual motion for resolution that has to go to a specific committee that has to be decided by the service of, of the parliament. And then it is approved or not by the chair of that committee with the, uh, with the consensus of the other groups. This is just the first phase, but I think if you have a political will, then you can adapt that will to a, a, a position that is specific in the legislation. And I do feel, uh, even by the experiences that are here uh, brought up, that civil society and several NGOs should also be included in this process uh, so we can absorb the maximum capability of their experience and data and then analyzes through probably a, a, a multidisciplinary uh, committee. Uh, but for me, it's obvious that the civil society must be involved like it is involved in so many other issues. And so I think we should also stop the stigma of talking about this because let's, po let's put uh, into the final point, imagine that this, this is nothing. Perfect. At least we all know, we all have the data, we can all arrive to the same conclusion. But if it's not, we also all have the data, we all arise to that conclusion. And so the path should be this. And I think politically, we should always include civil society, although, as Ryan stated, some issues may be from uh, national security concerns. But I would say that the, those would be just a, a slight minority. But again, civil society should also be included, of course. Yeah, please. Thank you. My name is Lee Dines and I'm the European Advisor for the Scientific Coalition of UAP Studies. Uh, the SEU is a think tank consisting of scientists, engineers and other pro professionals who dispassionately uh, research UAP. SEU has over 250 members, many from European countries, and approximately 90 of our members have PhD degrees. My question is to Christian. Um, Christian, what steps specifically can be taken with the aviation community to encourage pilots to report UAP sightings without fear of ridicule or professional repercussions, ultimately fostering a safer environment for data collection and analysis? I think, first of all, there should be 
First of all, there should be uh, uh, a form or a way, maybe an app where people, pilots, professional uh, observers can um, submit their sightings, including all the data that they uh, can provide, altitude, location, uh, duration, you name it. And besides there, there should be a central point for um, collecting that data and analyzing it, uh, maybe in reference to other sightings, known sightings, or even uh, space and weather phenomena. And I think the only way to do that is by basically build up a, a centralized uh, database organization to collect the data. And I think in the EU, it makes sense to centralize this on a European scale. Uh, there are some initiatives locally for different nationalities or sorry, different nations to collect the data, but I think this should be a European uh, database. And I think this European database in time can be maybe compared to US database as well, or other big organizations. So you don't have all this splintering of all the data being, uh, being gathered. I think that's the best way to go. So let me just uh, make a question that pop up here on the uh, on the chat online. Uh, these are not directed to to anyone, but uh, just one is directed to someone. So there are a few, but I will I will just make the one that is clearly directed to someone. So to Ryan from Gulam Sentinel News, he's asking: Are you satisfied with Arrow's latest reports, and are you happy with the aftermath? of that report in the uh, media. Ryan, to you. Sure, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, well, generally speaking, no, I'm not satisfied with the historical report that was released by the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office as of late. Now, I won't pretend to be a historian of the UAP topic going back to the 40s or, or earlier. Uh, however, one thing was clear is that the language and the dismissal that was inherent within that report did not align with the the Joint Chiefs of Staff recommendations for reporting UAPs that went out to all service branches. And in that reporting, they were very clear that this was a serious issue that was occurring internationally as well as domestically and was a concern both for aviation safety and for our domain awareness. So uh, I think that the report did focus on a few key uh, areas and they chose what they elected to speak about, but I think that the precedent of caring about this from a defense perspective is ongoing now and more important part of the conversation. So to answer the second part of that question is I would hope that the press would be more engaged in the national security angle of this than the uh the the little green man side of the conversation okay thanks just uh they were popping up a couple of questions i'll just run through them quickly because they are really straightforward does the european union have any plans for implementing uap study and reporting programs no and yes so no it doesn't have yes because i introduced an individual motion resolution that i hope it gains track uh not probably in this mandate but let's see does anyone know uh, if there's any animations made on recent UAP sightings which are available for developing education materials? No. Uh, does the European Union have any plans for uh, communicating this topic more efficiently with the public? Also no. Uh, and so, uh, a question directed to me. Um, do you have someone to replace yourself once you stand down from the Parliament? I hope so. So we are 720 next mandate, so I, I do hope there's a broad scope of parliamentary parliamentary uh, members also from different groups that talk about this issue. So I don't think this should be focused on one individual uh, political member. And for Ryan, um, what one thing could encourage Europe and the US to talk more about with each other on these uh, issues? Mm -hmm. And I will add up uh, if sh there should be like an international uh, political move inside the UN, for example, to really connect uh, this uh, this political drive also, because here it was, it was stated that the tools, the methodology should also be uh, combined or, or else we're just probably talking about the same events and we are not double checking the, the, the events and the facts. So to you, Ryan. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So from the perspective of the UN, I think it has a significant role to play as far as quarterbacking the coordination 
across Europe to be able to report this from an aviation safety perspective. Not only to quarterback it, to bring different players to the table in the context of aviation safety, but what happens with that data, bringing in experts to understand it, and then also looking at conflict lines. Uh, I believe the study of UAP and identifying unknown aircraft and objects within our airspace is critical for our national security. So around combat zones, around tension areas, our ability to identify these objects and deconflict from potential uh, conflicts is extremely important. Okay, now here. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm Danny Ammon from the German group GAP. We are a UFO investigation group in Germany, and um, I'm also a medical data scientist. And uh, I want to add on to the conversation that started with Frederick and also Lee and where we landed at some kind of a EU database collecting UAP data. I want to put a name on it. I, I'm I'm proposing FAIR UAP data. FAIR is a, an acronym from Research Data Management, which says data for research to be done on that needs to be findable. It needs to be accessible. It needs to be interoperable and it needs to be reusable. So all of these aspects, all over the 70, more than 70 years of UFO or UAP research that has been done, which we've heard about today, uh, we haven't been able to wholly collect data or to, uh, like, realize this FAIR data synonym or acronym that I just talked about. Uh, a lot of people today already talked about data collection and data quality. And this is something we need to achieve. And I think this is something we need resources and funding for because it's the basis for formulating like testable hypotheses on the topic of UAP. Like in the in the presentation of Beatrice, she formulated a, a very specific hypothesis and uh, she showed a way how to test it. And we can do that if we have the right database, but it's not just uh, uh, as the, the pilots uh, 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 very... Uh, understandably say it's not just limited to any border of any state or to the EU or to the USA because we need data about all of this and it has to be interchangeable and to usable all at once and this is something that that needs to be worked on would you agree with me <laughs> or anything to add to that thank you so much so in my in my position yes so it's a simple yes and we all have a name that will help the further yeah. further uh, debate on the topic i don't know if any speaker wants to to join on this topic uh, if the, not, the yeah. only thing i would like to add is i think it's important as well to create an awareness about the topic among uh, professionals that are not really into the topic as i said i only uh, stumbled upon the podcasts uh, that i mentioned before and i started to think about my own sightings and i think especially among pilots or military personnel um, many of them are not even aware about this whole topic and conversation so i think this should be part of um, let's say training of professionals and uh, creating general awareness just a little side side note to uh, to mention <clears throat> Also to add that I had a conversation with a few institutions uh, that, um, that I will not name because it's not really relevant, but I, I do feel there's a gap between the reporting of professionals and then the collection of that data and then the analysis of that data. And so there's there's a big gap between, between both, uh, which should be uh, eased if we had some type of legislation and tools to uh, help professionals to talk about it and then obviously analyze the data. So there. Yes, uh, my name is Robert Fleischer, German uh, journalist, Exo Magazine TV. My question uh, is uh, to you, Mr. Guerrero. Um, when you talk to uh, scientists, what they say is, first of all, we don't deal with the subject, first of all, because there's this huge stigma. And then second, we have no funding. And, and if, for example, we have um, a, a person that is perfectly uh, capable of, of uh, studying this at the University of Würzburg in Germany, Professor Hakan Kayal with his Interdisciplinary uh, Research Institute, but he has no funding. So my question is, is there any chance that you see what could the, the European Parliament do to provide funding for uh, this uh, kind of research? Yeah, so uh, interesting question because uh, we are debating the next year uh, budget uh, on the, of the European Union and we ha just approve the guidelines. So the political uh, priorities of the next EU uh, budget. Uh, 
uh, which all, it's already defined in quantities, but you all always have some margins to allocate to different programs. And that's the political debate. So we introduced some political priorities. I made two amendments, uh, one amendment, sorry, that was talking about the European space law and the possibility of uh, having finance uh, to research these questions, but in the end, the compromise amendments, that part didn't enter. But again, uh, it was a move to try to politically talk about the issue. Uh, but the next mandate will also debate annually the budget, and you can reach the politicians, especially in the budget committee, trying to understand what uh, are the uh, roads available to reach this financing. I think politically, this should be set uh, as a, a priority. And then people can understand that there are credible professionals, especially in the scientific community, that wants to debate this issue in a very scientific way. Because we know there's a lot of noise surrounding this subject, but we have the, the means, we have the funds, we just need the political priority. So then we can channel through the, the means that's, that already exist. Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Peter Skafish with the Seoul Foundation. I'm the executive director. I'm a cultural anthropologist as well. I have a question for everyone on the panel. Um, you know, we have a lot of activity, as we've noted today, on UAP taking place in the United States. But we found it difficult um, because of the amount of energy we devote to the topic there with limited resources to build bridges to Europe. So what could the U.S. government do to help all of you on the one hand, and what could civil society organizations uh, like ours do as well, um, you know, in the way of collaboration on data sharing, uh, policy building, and even uh, diplomatic and interparliamentary activity? Well, I would say that first, these political discussions are very relevant for us to uh, find the decrease the stigma surrounding this topic, also presenting the speakers that have very scientific and concrete uh, experience and positions and presentations is also, uh, I think, a very important step. Uh, and then afterwards, it's just a political will. If you have the political will and you have players in both sides, you can go through, through very institutions, you can go by a parliamentary uh, events, because we know that there's a bipartisan push on the U.S. Here, we still don't have that political uh, will, but imagine that we have in the next mandate. There then can be like a, co a coalition of efforts to try to push this topic to another level. So again, for me, uh, and I'm, I've been here for five years, it's more a political will, and then you'll find the tools to arrive to, to those uh, cooperations. Um, there are, I think, would be gradual. So as, as, as we saw, First events, then the, the exchange of experience, then people get together, then they analyze what can be done, and step by step, we, we, we approach this topic in a, a very scientific and open uh, manner. I would go to, to that uh, person that was there that I ignored because I didn't see you, sorry. <laughs> yeah, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for, for the initiative and inviting us. I'm uh, Jose Penedo. Chief Political Affairs of uh, European Union Aviation Safety Agency, uh, based in, in Cologne. I want to make uh, um, just a remark, just because there are civilian pilots as well here. There is already a system in place in the EU for reporting. Uh, there is a regulation where the pilots and other professionals can report already. Uh, it's open to everybody of the professional association. And this is existing already. That's to say that the EU has been active on that. Uh, it's not that there is nothing, as you mentioned. And uh, you can have access to our website. It's explained everything there. And we have been in touch with you, MEP Guerrero, and we have been exchanging. So there is already something there. Can be improved. We can talk about uh, funding and um, more tools. But it's already something where you can freely, uh, based on just culture, uh, report to the EU, in this case, ASA, but on behalf of the Commission and the EU. 
Is this related to the uh, regular flight safety and airprox reports that pilots are supposed to submit, or is this completely something else? Is this uh, uh, specifically for UAP? It's free for, for professionals to report. And it is but, a, but is it specifically for UAP, or is it flight no, safety no, no, in general? No, no, no. This is a different story. Of course, uh, it's everything. Yeah, but you can report everything there. And, uh, of course, maybe we can work on, on more specific issues, but uh, it's free for you as a professional civil pilot to report whatever you see. Yeah, it, uh, the problem is there are uh, um, big safety reporting systems in place for every airline, uh, which is contributing to the safety of aviation as we uh, have it right now. But if I file a report just through my own company saying, well, I've seen a funny light in the sky, um, my company cannot really do anything with that. So the biggest issue is, is that if it's specifically about UAP, um, there, first of all, there's no awareness among pilots for such a database reporting point in place. And it should be um, clearly communicated as well that there's a, a call out for all aviators to report these things. I'm not even aware of that. And I'm flying for 20 years now uh, for European airlines. So it's interesting to hear. And I think, yeah, well, <laughs> I would be interested to, to hear about that. Uh, for example, this would be interesting for pilots in training to inform them about this, or airlines to inform them, uh, that the pilots uh, have a way to report it. So for me, it's the first time I hear it. Yeah, that, that's the, 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 um, the proposal that I made was to uh, improve that regulation. So it clearly states UAP. So it doesn't uh, enter the, the realm of just safety because sometimes it's not correlated even with safety, just concerns that that pilot have. But the effort is being made. There's some tools. Let's improve them and let's move forward because uh, clearly there's a gap between the experience of uh, several pilots and, and, other, uh, and other professionals uh, on other areas and the... Um, the connection between then the, the collection of data and then the monitoring and the reporting of those data to civil society also and to EU institution uh, because communication is lacking also uh, uh, in several ways. So I'll just uh, give to. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, I am Michael Vaillant. Uh, I am working for the French uh, GEPANS in uh, 16 years. Just uh, I am not talking for the GEPAN, because I am a private consultant, but I know very well how it works, uh, in particular in, uh, regarding the methodology and uh, the aspect of uh, data science. On my question, of course, uh, there, is, did you think about the uh, aspect of uh, anxiety uh, regarding the witnesses? Because, you know, in the mission of the GEPAN, you have three missions. Uh, one mission is to answer to the public uh, to the question they have when they observe some things. And you have m many, many people, like uh, uh, we, we said uh, today, which will observe something in the sky and cannot have a clear answer. So, in a way, it's a question of public education and also helping people. Uh, did you think about this idea on uh, how it could be connected to uh, what you propose? Yes, just to let uh, everyone feel free to comment if you want to jump in at any point. Please feel free to, to add some comments. Uh, related to this, uh, uh, my, my, my proposal is, is, um, is the principle, is the base for uh, new developments in my sites, I feel that there should be hearings with expertise also. Uh, uh, public institutions that already work on this field for us politicians to absorb what might be this uh, structural uh, change that we might, that we need to do in uh, EU regulations. So we then have an efficient tool to collect this data, to analyze, to communicate, to educate also politicians, also professionals everyone that, that should be involved in this topic. Uh, and so I think the next step, ideally for me, if I would draw the, the steps would be having some auditions insights. If this motion passes, for example, we could have it in the specific committee, an audition with key stakeholders. So we then have a more in-depth analysis on how can we construct or reform 
or improve the existing regulations. Yes. Of course. <clears throat> I'd like to comment uh, <clears throat> something because we, we talked about the Japan and uh, you mentioned one of the missions. What is interesting, uh, has been interesting in the last 10 years at last, is that Japan, that is an official uh, body, has called at least twice uh, um, a conference, a meeting, a closed shop meeting involving civilian researchers. It was some scientists, it was some uh, UAP researchers getting together to compare methodologies about the collection and analysis of data. This is an example that the, we should follow. I feel sure that Japan is going on this road, but any other institutional uh, office uh, procedure and so on might profit from 70 years of experience and of knowledge of those that have been going on doing this work for free as volunteers, because it's a, a large quantity of information and documentation that may be shared, not just uh, open another office, like Ryan was saying, <clears throat> the old domains anomaly resolution office that is not talking with uh, anybody else. We don't even know what they are doing concretely. We can see some output, but there is a large knowledge base spread that should be put together and given to those, the scientists, that are the only ones that should be able to do something with that. We can collect it. We have mm -hmm. done it. And so it's a good uh, way to work together. Just to let you know that we have more or less 50 minutes and then we have to end our, our uh, event. So you can be because you didn't speak yet. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, actually, I'd like to come back on the point um, about the current activities of the um, European uh, Aviation Safety Agency. Unfortunately, the colleague just left, but we feel um, the current system we looked at that is actually not sufficient. Um, of course, pilots could use it, <clears throat> but the um, topic of UAP is really not explicitly included in the regulation. So our suggestion is that we would sit together with a number of civil um organizations working on this topic and come up and, uh, of course, including pilots and together come up jointly with how we feel this uh, could be improved. And I think if we propose this to you or maybe directly to EASA, that could be um, helpful. So that's one comment I'd like to make. The other one is um, actually um, coming back to the, the point made earlier about what we could um, do together with the U.S. I think the um, organization ASA the aviation, um, the Organization for Safe American uh, uh, Airspace is uh, very relevant and important. I think we can learn from them. Um, I'm impressed, actually, that you were able to um, initiate a whole change in the legislation uh, in a rather short period of time, I would say. You did it uh, last year. Maybe you can expand a little bit on how you actually achieved that. Did you go directly to the... Um, uh, people in the House of Representatives, and the Senate, etc. But I think we can learn from that and see how we can actually jointly, with a lot of people sitting around the room, think about how we can um, uh, collaborate with you also, uh, how we can learn from you. Thank you. Yes, so Ryan, after this last intervention, you can jump in, okay? Please. Yeah, I just wanted to add something uh, about the EASA form. It's a, it's a pity the gentleman uh, had to leave already. Um, but I would like to suggest that EASA might consider uh, adding a UAP fielder, specifically a way to report UAP in that form that uh, the gentleman uh, mentioned. And I think it would be a valid question as well if EASA would be willing to spend some money and budget into educating pilots about UAP and also in an effort, long-term effort, to get rid of the stigma. I think these three things are uh, connected and EASA can play a key role in this process. We'll co convene the, uh, these informations for sure to, to as Ryan, if you want to jump in. Certainly. I'll, I'll just add very quickly on that last point that education is extremely important in this topic. We, of course, have aviation safety reporting mechanisms within the United States as well, but the vast majority of reporting uh, goes unreported. 
uh, or the, the vast rec- vast majority of cases go unreported due to the fact of lack of education, the stigma, and the fact that the reporting is in a very narrow uh, avenue of aviation safety that some of these cases uh, may not fall into particularly. Um, but as far as the legislation piece, um, you know, I will add, yes, it did uh, get through relatively quickly, or at least got to an end state and was introduced relatively quickly. Uh, the bill still needs to get uh, voted on, of course, uh, to pass, uh, and we are looking to attach that uh, legislation to some bills that are coming up later this year to uh, hopefully expedite that process. But in order to make that bill uh, move through the process as quickly as possible, there was a lot of work done before, and that work consisted of reaching out to pilot unions to, uh, well, it in general to different stakeholders within uh, that would be affected by the bill, but uh, that involved pilot unions, pilots themselves, uh, the FAA, uh, Aero, and other offices that would be uh, affected by this change. And we went back and forth to ensure this legislation would be beneficial to all those different parties that are looking to get better information about this problem. Um, that was a lot of the legwork that we did. And after the hearing, there was a lot of support within Congress to bring a bill forward that could help mitigate some of the issues that pilots were having. And so we used that opportunity to bring forward some of those recommendations to some of the key congressmen and women that were interested in the topic. Uh, and from there, uh, a lot more vetting, but we were able to grow support for it, and we continue to uh, grow support in both the House and the Senate for uh, that piece of legislation. And we're hopeful it'll get uh, signed this year or voted on this year. Thanks, Ryan. Just uh, two questions that I would present to the speakers if anyone would, would like to, to jump in. Uh, first one is how do we undo the stigma attached to this topic? So if anyone wants to, to add on this. And the second one, if, sh- there, sh- if there should be a difference between uh, the reporting of professionals and the reporting of, for example, public and citizens, or if it should be the same channel, this was just a, a question that was presented in the, in the online chat. So just these two. If anyone wants to jump in, please. In regard to the topic of um, analyzing data from uh, professionals like so-called credible observers, I think it's important to make a distinction between people who see something in uh, their backyard, let's say, or professionals who see something during their work. It's not because those uh, sightings might be uh, more credible or not. The point is that credible observers like military, uh, aviators, etc., they see something during the line of work. Uh, for if, if I just uh, reflected back on myself, when I'm flying and I'm looking out of my windows, I'm constantly looking out for other airplanes. I'm looking for, in a, let's say, in my professional um, point of view, for things that could conflict with my airplane. If I see something that I cannot identify, I try to rationalize it. I know what kind of altitude we're flying. Possibly I can take pictures of it. I can report all the data that comes with it. And people who see something, let's say, in the backyard or during a walk with their dog, um, it's very difficult to establish the circumstances in which they've seen something. And I think this, um, those kind of uh, anecdotes might be very interesting. It's in- interesting to collect that data, but the anecdotal evidence from pilots or military observers uh, adds some extra weight because, as I said, we see it from our professional point of view, and we can collect the data under which we, we've seen those uh uh, reports and also, for example, it can be corroborative with uh, radar data from the ground. But I think all these things considered, um, there should be an emphasis on credible observers who see something in the line of duty. <clears throat> the question was interesting and well posed. Uh, yes, it's completely different to collect data and investigate and analyze data from uh, uh, generic sightings of things seen in the sky. And on the opposite, from pilots or about uh, physical effects uh, or even just photographic reports, they all need a different approach. But this is not starting from scratch. It is already existing. As I said, we have been amassing a sort of knowledge. As an example, I am a national director for the MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. If you have a look at uh, the methodology manual, and the type of collection, the, the questionnaire forms, they are completely different, the special cases from the generic cases. 
When we were in Kaipan in the first uh, seminar by Japan in Paris 10 years ago, a university professor from the USA, Richard Haynes, that was a founder of the North American Research Center on Anomalous Phenomena that has been collecting pilot sightings, explained to us how to investigate uh, a sighting by a pilot. That is a completely different situation from an observer on the ground. You have to look at different uh, things. You may ask for different data. So yes, we have to have, and sometimes we already have different protocols for data collection, for data analysis. It's not just a mixed bag that where we put everything that is in, it would uh, serve to nothing. That's the, my, my two cents answer to the question. Okay, so just the last one, because we only have five minutes and I have to close. First one and last one, <laughs> it's Azar. So uh, I'm also a teacher, and I think that uh, topics could be a good occasion to make citizen science and to learn to, to, to educate young people inside schools uh, or to the critic and to learn the skies what they are in the, what the, the, there is in the skies, planes, stars, and so on. It's also a good occasion. And uh, European Union have some tools to touch the young people inside the, the community. Yeah, I feel I have two kids, and I feel that now we are just stuck here and not looking at, at above. Um, well, uh, I would... Uh, do you want to, to jump in? No, okay, because you did like this. No, okay. <laughs> so I'll I'll stay by here because we only have like uh, four minutes. I would like to to thank everyone that was present and that uh, watched online. Uh, probably some will just watch this later on. Also, thank you to all the journalists that are making a good work reporting this credibly. Uh, all the professionals that are working uh, scientifically on this topic and that really want that the EU moves ahead and also surpasses the US on, on these topics. And then we all united can, hand, can have a very scientific approach uh, on this topic. Uh, I do feel that we need a political leadership here in the European Union. Uh, I hope that the next mandates can uh, lead us to that path. Again, thank you for everyone that uh, was here, that was uh, sharing their experience, their knowledge uh, to all the questions that were made. And uh, thank you very much. I do advise to follow all the institutions and all the, the speakers that were here on the social media, because it's always a good place for us to, to learn about the new developments. And uh, then I will also share this, um, these events in my uh, social media. So feel free to share and then use it as much as you can. Thank you very much again. And a special thanks for our guest in the US that is far, but really close to, to, to our hearts. Thank you very much to all. Bye-bye.